Good evening, everybody. I didn't know that uh, I had a reputation that preceded me. I guess maybe you were talking to John. <laughs> but I just got, as he said, a lot of slides, but I'll be going through them very quickly. So uh, uh, I just have to kind of do some little explanation of things. As I took this trip to Indonesia in August, September of uh, 2011, and I had signed up for a tour of Indonesia, a textile tour specifically, and the tour fell through, but I already had the plane ticket, and so I jumped from one puddle to the other trying to figure out what to do until John told me just to get the hell out, and so I did. <laughs> I followed the original itinerary of the tour and had some assistance from the people who had sponsored it, an organization known as Threads of Life. Uh, Threads of Life is based in Bali, and it's a kind of 503C, although I don't think they have 503Cs in Bali, but it's uh, based there, and it's a non-profit non sort of thing. The two people that started it, I guess about 20 years ago now, uh, we're trying to revive some of the textile traditions of Bali and also do some basic economic development. They originally had only one or two little groups of women that they got together in order to work on this. They now have approximately 60 groups that are affiliated with them throughout the islands. And uh, it's had an ecological benefit too because Threads of Life is very, very picky. Their prices are high, but they're very, very picky. They demand organic dyes and hand woven, and that's it, end of story. And some weavers tried to pass off non-organic non dyes and, and were kind of dropped from the list. As a result of that, there are a lot of areas in the forests that have been preserved because the women need the plants there, so they won't let the guys go down and chop the trees or dig up the roots or whatever it might happen to be. And uh, they used to spread all over Indonesia, and Indonesia is spread all over. It's, <laughs> it stretches over 3,000 miles, much of which is only either on the equator or five or six degrees north and south of the equator, and has 18,000 plus islands, 6,000 of which are inhabited. Uh, <laughs> It's volcanic, as we all know. We've all gotten the history lessons about Krakatoa and such, and it sits on three tectonic plates so that there's something going there all, all times. It's tropical, it's always hot and humid. And I have a friend who would like to go there in the winter, and we keep trying to convince her that there is no winter there. <laughs> okay. It's also very divergent in their culture and uh, differences in islands. Um, historically, the indigenous people were Malay. Buddhism arrived in about the 6th century. After that, we had Hinduism arrive, and then Islam arrived, and then the Dutch arrived. The Dutch were not nice. Uh, there's a lot of bad feelings about the Dutch in Indonesia, and eventually the uh, Dutch the nation received, got its independence. Uh, Indonesia, even though you know we probably don't think of very much of it, is actually a place of world importance in history because they were the original spice islands and it was the boredom of Western food in Europe. And they say, oh my God, the same thing again. I need something to perk this up. And they started to get cinnamon and other things from areas in the Pacific. Started the great exploratory voyages of the Portuguese and the Spanish to go over to get the spices from Indonesia and other areas uh, around Indonesia. That spice trade and the battling that went along with it was the impetus for how the East was one, as one of my colleagues once called it. The other thing that Indonesia promoted, believe it or not, is the theory of evolution. Because Darwin was sitting around and he was sitting on all of his thoughts for years and years. And another Alfred Russell Wallace went off to various places. He was a great naturalist. He went off to Indonesia. 
and saw all the variations and all the different animals and plants and everything there. And he wrote to Darwin and said, hey, I got this hot idea. And Darwin said, oh my goodness, I got to do something here. And his family advisor said, yeah, you got to do it fast. And they published the very first discussion of origin of species jointly before the Royal Society in the 1850s. Wallace also went from island to island, and there is a line found in the Pacific Ocean in Indonesia called the Wallace Line. It's from Bali, and then the next island over is Lombok. Totally different ecosystems there that have been named after him. But that's all that great stuff. And, the and this particular trip, I went to three islands. I started off in Bali. After that, went to another island called Flores. And the last one was Java. Java is a fairly large island. Bali is very small. Uh, specifically in Java was the city of Jakarta, commonly called Jogja, which is the cultural center of Indonesia. It's just kind of you know where the heartbeat of the whole nation is. These places have different kinds of textiles. And they all have traffic. <laughs> so this, when you get to Bali, and it started off in Bali, I did not go to any of the beach resorts in Bali. I have no idea what they look like. I know they're there. Uh, given the condition that I'm in, the last thing I want to do is be put aside one of these little Australians wearing next to nothing. So. <laughs> But the first thing that you encounter in Bali is the traffic, and it's continuous everywhere there. So you go from the airport to the city of Ubud, which is the uh, uh, craft and art center of Bali, and there's motorcycles. And we got there, and they had these large things there on the side of the street. Every house had one. They'd been up for about four weeks, and then ultimately they were going to be taken down and burned. There's a lot of religion in Bali. <laughs> and got to a very comfortable hotel with a divine bath so you could get all of your fantasies of tropical showers. And a little table there had breakfast. And if you want to really relax in the divan and we have the dancing girls come out, there you are. <laughs> and observe the garden. And there's the gardener. And the gardener wears sarongs. The men in Bali on the whole in the Ubud area, if they're doing anything, any kind of traditional thing, they wear sarongs. And they also, that brown part of it is a kind of a hip wrap that goes on that men wear but women don't. I, I have no idea what the purpose of it is. The other thing that you see a lot of in Indonesia, and particularly in Bali, is stone sculpture. It is everywhere, and it's in varying degrees of, of uh, some of it is old and getting eroded, sort of thing. But there's a guy who is guarding the gate where you buy your ticket to go to the monkey forest. And the hotel that I was in was on the opposite side of the monkey forest, and I had to walk through it to get to town. And there is the thing is saying, hey, you know, it's quite a neighborhood. Here's, it's the, the monkeys and the forest is a sacred territory. And here's a little monkey, and he says, Ooh, what is this creature coming at me? And mom, protect me. And the other thing that he wanted to be protected from is this amazing shrieking going on that I didn't have my camera ready for it, but they have signs all over saying, do not bring food into this park. Do not bring brown bags into this park. Do not bring water bottles into this park. <laughs> Some young lady, I, to do her credit, I think she was trying to put her water bottle inside of her bag, but she didn't make it, and the monkey came up to get it. And it ran and it grabbed the water bottle, so she held it in the air like the Statue of Liberty. Didn't stop the monkey at all. He just climbed right up her and <laughs> got the bottle. <laughs> And to prove that he knows what it was and how to handle it, he started taking the cap off of it. And there he is, stuck his hand in it, grabbed it, up a tree and gone. <laughs> it's a good thing it's only the water bottle because they have a tendency to go for shiny glasses and other things like that. 
These also have uh, sacred trees here. These banyan tree is approximately 300 years old, and it has other trees there. And you can see the, from the uh, little folk down there against uh, the uh, walk going down past that other banyan tree, along with the sculpture, is notice the cow there, which is a direct relationship to Hindu religion. Down with all the lead, all the roots from the banyans, they're really amazing. There I am. <laughs> and also, this is park worker. Wearing this around, wearing his hip wrap, the park workers are also trained to divert the monkeys from taking, or get, they'll get back stuff that, from the monkeys that <laughs> you don't want them to have. And the little monkey saying, what's going on? He said, well, I've got a bite to eat, but I know the place to go, sort of thing. You're the little turtles, some little frogs, back out on the street. I eventually found a room on that street. It was not in this place, but it was similar. This is another house, believe it or not, where it's being decorated for their own personal worship of the gods. And this is nothing special as far as we would consider something like this. It's like, you know, maybe you do this on your birthday or New Year's or something. They do this all the time in Bali. Everywhere you go, they have these things. This is water, and it's got all these little flowers and leaves that have been arranged on it. Some of them are on the fancy hotels are absolutely astonishing. Big market that... I was overwhelmed in. They had all kinds of textiles there, but they had so many I couldn't cope with it. More sculpture. This is an old shrine, and uh, the entire interior is painted with the typical Ramayana scenes of wars and gods and this and that and the other. And they're all really you know, very, very well done. And of course, needless to say, they're done again and again from time to time. You'll notice that he has a black and white kind of sash on. At that other place, the other shrine we saw, is fricasseeing, you know, the enemy. And <laughs> there's sort of, you'll see the black and white pattern, the check pattern, in many, many places. And here it's, you know, like, who's afraid of the big bad wolf or whatever. I have no idea what the details of these stories are. They're very complex and, you know, run to hundreds of pages. These young people were get, taking their wedding pictures there. So, <laughs> I got really done dressed up sort of for it. And then we remove ourselves for the next part of our little adventure, is that the man here with backpack is a Westerner and had been wearing shorts when he got to this site. And that is not considered respectful, so that if you go there and you're wearing shorts, they will drape you in a sarong so that you're not going to be offensive to anything that they think will be offended. And in case you didn't get it first time, you can always buy one on the street. Looks like another temple, right? Really elaborate. It's a weaving factory. Everybody, we hear all the time of Bali batiks. It's been promoted by some of the uh, batik and the fabric manufacturers as Bali batiks, Bali batiks, Bali batiks. They never had batiks in Bali. <laughs> they, all the batiks were made in Java. The fabric that was made originally in, in uh, Bali was an ikat. Uh, I think that probably Hoffman and the other companies picked the Bali Batik because they want to say, just a card of Batik, who's going to pay any attention to that? But <laughs> Bali has got, you know, we all know Bali is a kind of a wonderful dream place and it's worked really well. Ikat is a technique of weaving where you dye the threads before you weave the cloth. Now on that table over there and that wall over there are all Ikats. The ones on the wall are from a village and from Flores. A couple of them on the table on the left are from Bali, particularly the uh, green and white one. Um, you can see where they're weaving one of these, and if you hard to see, hard to see it, but over here there's these threads that are hanging are black and white. 
they had been died prior to being going on the loom. You can see on the loom that the threads going that way are all green. Those are called warp. This is warp. And this is a weft. Sometimes it's called woof, but it's weft. So this is a weft ecot. Is that this is nothing that's been done here, but this is all dyed in advance and it's going to bring out, it brings out the pattern as you go. This is another one, a little more complicated. This is how the process is done. First of all, they take all of these threads and put them on a frame and they're separated in bundles of, you know, whatever they think they need, 50, 100, whatever. It looks like it's been dyed already, right? Pretty red flowers and green ferns and stuff like green vines. Actually, all that red and all that green is this little knife plastic thread. It's, you know, it's like about a quarter of an inch wide. It's a cheap thing that they use for packaging. Somebody went through and tied. They wrapped those bundles of thread and tied them around there. Yeah. By hand. The machine did not do this. It's sad, sorry. And ultimately, it's dyed. And then after it's dyed and it's dried, we have this man who has an extremely tricky job because he's got the fabric hanging in front of him with all of those little bundles of plastic, plastic uh, wrapping thing. And he's got a very sharp little tool. And he has to cut that off without cutting any of the threads because this is going to get put on a loom to go this way. And it has to be one continuous thread sort of thing. Because if, if you cut it, it's going to really mess up the pattern, you know, sort of thing. And you can see here that this one has already been all cut and it's all just kind of sitting there and close up on it. And see all the, the little details of the, see where it, it had been dyed and, and it's, it, there it is. And some of that still has not been cut with the top there, sort of thing. Oh, and then they're just drying, stuff is just drying out. Uh, this was the scene outside the front edge of the factory sort of thing there, and uh, we had a takeaway lunch, looked pretty good. <laughs> it was really nice. They had, I don't know what these plants are, I know that one of them is a bird's nest fern. This is the durian. Uh, it looks sort of like, you know, something that would be a lethal weapon. I think that actually it could be a lethal weapon because it's very, very spiky, you know, and, very, and the, the rind is very hard. The fruit is delicious, but it smells terrible, and it's been described as eating a cream custard while you're sitting in an open latrine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. <laughs> This is jackfruit. The jackfruit has been wrapped up in plastic, the bigger ones, to protect it from the depredations of monkeys and other stuff there. A jackfruit can grow to be about 60 pounds. And this little baby is, is commonly called a crab claw plant, and so as you can tell from the color, the design of it. And you know, living in the jungle, and over to the left, those are bananas and, and stuff like that. We're going across this little river and into the woods and find this man starting what is known as a supplemental weft. He's put these um, threads out on the loom, and it's a backpack, back strap loom. It's not one of those big machines. The fabric will be no more than about 15, 16 inches wide. What the supplemental weft does is you just keep weaving this thing, but at certain points and around certain ways that the threads are lifted up, you'll add a different color to it. And I've got a couple of pieces there of supplemental weft weaving. He is setting it up so that each time, you see, he's got this metal tool and he's lifting up the threads to determine the pattern, and he's got the pattern in front of him as a guide there, and then he will tie it, put strings through there in order to hold these up 
so that ultimately you'll have a lot of strings to be able to do this weaving, which this lady is doing. You can see all of these other little things of, of different colored threads in there, and so each time a different set of warps comes up, she'll put in different colors of things to get the pattern to come out. It's another time-consuming thing. That's an example of some of the designs that they would get. More of them. They, they actually, I hate to have to say it, but these are very simple supplemental weft weavings. As I, you know, I was a little disappointed in it, but there it is. And they had also had some very nice plaids they did. And they, so also, also again, it's organic dyes, except for that big one laying on there. This one here is that that's not organic dye. The colors are very harsh. I ended up buying these two pieces that the lady is showing. Is those are all organic dyes, and they have little supplemental web designs. They're on the table over there. This lady, charming, kind of fun, sit there smiling. She's got two master's degrees and teaches at the local school, and she's a very, very widely known expert in organic dyes. You know, she looks at it and tells you what kind of plant it came from. And there we go, back to Ubud. <laughs> and here is a procession. I'm going off to another thing at a temple, uh, dragging in one of the shrines, and these. Um, events go on at night after dark, usually starting at about 8 o'clock. If you notice the way their arms are, and they're holding their fingers and stuff, later on we'll see how these are shown in textiles. And it, they're really, they're very, you know, it's really beautiful to watch them, sort of thing. And <laughs> they also got men there, you know, they're constantly fighting these wars back in the old uh, sagas of the Ramayana and stuff like that. And it, it, the, <laughs> this one, I think, is like, he's good looking. This one, you know, the little man. I love this guy. <laughs> he's really, don't know what to make of him, but he's just charming. And there's his two of them talking, and then he points over there, and he said, you know, see what's going on over here, fella. And there's a nice looking guy there, but you really did not want to meet that one in the dark alley. <laughs> you know that. The people are quite devout. This temple was devoted to Shiva. These uh, celebrations went on for three days. Um, and, then, and, and they're very devout, really, in that there is belief in there. Then people had brought offerings to the temple prior to these festivities, and each group was taking them home and saying, and they go down, the one in the middle seems to have some problems with negotiating the stairs. They really are amazing, you know, because they, they're not holding it up to hold it the strength, but just to keep it from falling down. It's unbalanced, can it un become unbalanced very easily. These things are set up with a pole in the middle so that you put in your first layer of fruit or whatever, and then you can put on another disc of wood and then pile another layer of fruit on top of it to build the entire pyramid you know, of three or four feet high. Uh, it's assumed by this time that the gods have consumed the spiritual essence of the food and that you can take it home and do the real thing. Now, if you're a vegetarian, avert your eyes. It's a very famous restaurant, famous for roast pig. It, it's really good. <laughs> but then, and they have more people coming around late at night for uh, another session of, of dancing and things. Is that and kids stay up late? I mean, you got the kid, you know, it's a two-year-old. He's there. They just fall asleep on the ground. And, Away they go. This one is a barong. He's uh, actually a lion, like in lion dances that they have in China and Japan and Korea. Beautiful masks. Doing, but this one, when you see something like this, you know you've got to get out of town. So, the Take Wings is the airline that was flying to Flores. Flores was about an hour away. Um, Flores is a totally different culture. Bali is Hindu. Indonesia is the largest population, Islamic population in the world. But 
Pali is Hindu. Flores, beautiful place, here's the airport. This is the largest airport in Flores. You don't have much question about where your luggage is going to be coming in. And this is how we repaired a wheelchair that needed help. It's got a little lawn chair pushed right into it. Flores is also very, very well known for scuba diving and uh, snorkeling. So we went out there and you see all these fishermen with their little boats. The little boats out on the sea, two inches of freeboard. Beautiful scene, right? Here's the beautiful water, beach, <coughs> green trees, stuff, and then there's this smoke, and you think, of, oh, well, it's like in Oregon on the coast, the mist rises. This is slash and burn agriculture, so that what the uh, inhabitants of this part of the island are going out in there and picking themselves out a piece of jungle and cutting it all down, burning it up, and then growing their crops. It will take a hundred or so years for it to regain its natural state, if it ever does. Believe it or not, I went snorkeling here, and I got just an unbelievable sunburn. <laughs> But it was some of the best I've ever, waters I've ever been in. So it was really wonderful. Fishermen always having to repair nets. And there's the bar. So that you could sit there and watch the sunset. Where you stayed in this place was in little cottages that were very comfortable and well set up. Except the one that I was in, they had some incredible noise going on on Saturday night. And it was just, you know, rock and roll and rap and let's dance and all the rest of it. And I thought, well, you know, Flores on Saturday night, what you going to do? And I found out the next day <laughs> that they were celebrating the fact that there were a bunch of kids going to be celebrating their, uh, having their first communion that morning. Flores is Catholic. <laughs> and they have different ideas about how you celebrate a first communion. <laughs> but it is Catholic. <laughs> This is on the way to the village of Watagalapi. Uh, this is the head man and the head of the Watagalapi kind of association. In fact, this was just a stroke of luck for me because all of these people had come out on a boat cruise and spent big bucks to have this whole thing put together. And uh, I just happened to walk into it. And you were greeted essentially with a traditional band along with, you know, drums and stuff like that. Lady ringing her bells. They gave us little things to keep us happy. Uh, that thing laying across there is a cigarette. And, uh, and the other little pieces are uh, beetle nut and wine, so that you can put together a little thing of chewing beetle nut, which is people do in many, many places in Asia, particularly in Indonesia. Um, I tried it just because I always wanted to try it, and it does make your spit red, so that's the way it goes. <laughs> and then they had some dancing and ceremonial things, some of which had been associated with a wedding. The ladies came out with these big bamboo poles, and this little old man started doing some special drumming. This other guy climbs up the pole with a machete, and does some acrobatics up there. It was really amazing to watch, and how he got himself like this, and then turned around like that, I don't know. But, you know, he did, and then the other little old man looking up saying, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then they also had their home brew, so we can let the good times roll. So, <laughs> all the kids came out to watch this, uh, because Specifically because these things are designed also to help promote the culture and inculcate this into the kids. Note the green skirts and the yellow blouse, yellow shirts on these kids. Those are Catholic school uniforms, you know, sort of thing, so that they're, they're all getting their education in many ways. And then there's this young lady, and she looks like she's a teenager. She has a different hairstyle. She doesn't have that bun on the top of her head, so I think she's an unmarried young woman. And this guy looks like her father, saying, God, what am I going to do with this girl? You know? <laughs> and also, this very, very beautiful dancing. As I know that you had this on the uh, uh, email that was sent out. And this man, it looks like nothing can make him happy. 
This was part of the wedding ceremony, and this man comes in, and he is on the groom's side, and he offers to the mother of the bride this elephant tusk. I think the symbolism is clear. <laughs> he gets <laughs> one of these weavings that has been made. There's one of them over there on the far wall. It's made for a wedding. They're not worn. They're just there, and they get it like a, a gift, an engagement thing, and you know, like, I got this, that's all they need to say, is, is we have this. Uh, and this is the man who's the head man, and he, <laughs> he's really good looking, isn't he? <laughs> and we all dance, we all dance out of me. <laughs> and there's the poor little girl again. <laughs> And this one is giggling for whatever reason. Notice all the red, white, and blue skirts are all traditional. Well, I counted that one bit back there. This one's showing a skirt. Various weavings that were done by all the women in this village, some of which are on the walls. This is how they're done. They do use some commercial cotton. They also do hand spun. So here's the lady doing the hand spinning of the thread. Passing it on, carding it, combing it, etc., etc. Here is a beautiful hairstyle. Those things in front of her are where she is tying raffia, little palm leaf, or whatever it is, around the threads. These are the dyeing process going on, along with all the various kinds of plants that are used for it. And I say to some kukui nuts and other mordants that are used to keep the dye on the cloth. This lady is laying out the loom. The one difference that you see from the stuff in Bali is that the design runs the long way, not the crossway. So that when this is woven, the design is sort of there, and what she's doing is tying each. When you're doing weaving, you've got to be able to lift the threads up and down. And you do that by tying another thread on a stick over that. You pick up the stick and, and go up and down with it. Uh, and this is the weaving process. It's what's known as a backstrap loom. And so we've got it set up here, and the lady just kind of wears it on the front and back, leans into it in order to maintain the tension of the thread. And then all of the thread that's going back and forth will be the same color. And here you are. <laughs> and there is the wedding uh, piece. And um, this is just to give you a little sticker shock. Yeah, three million there, right? And that's a hefty piece of change, you know. And so it's ten thousand to a dollar though, so <laughs> it's still a hefty piece of change, but it's nowhere near that price. These uh, particular tags are to work with the people at Threads of Life. Threads of Life demands this kind of label on it so that everything is traceable. This lady would not drop a penny on her price. She knew I wanted this, and she just, you could tell the smug look and say, okay, let me open it up, I'm gonna get it. You know, she's a nice lady here. She's a lot. The green is very nice. And this is the old mama of the village. And this is a lady from a totally different village, got different clothes and everything else, and just came around for the day's excitement. And this particular piece was done by a totally different village on the island of Flores, which I could not get to because I had carefully, carefully picked a flight at five in the afternoon so that on my last day there I could go out to this other village and do some more poking around. And so the airline decided not to fly anymore, so I had to leave early and cut the, cut the trip short. One of the things though that I did be able to get at the, uh, at the uh, place I stayed is they had some weavings. And this is a cute little number. <laughs> The animal is a komodo dragon. <laughs> they had komodo dragons on the other side of the island. I did not ever want to see any of those, thank you, but they made them specifically for the tourist trade. Next stop we're going to is uh, Java. 
John Jakarta. This is a particular flower. It is um, called the Buddha flower. And according to what people have dreamed up on this, is that this is the lotus blossom and that the little yellowish parts above it in the back are Buddha sitting there and that the petals reach over and they say that's like the snakes that are normally shown on a uh, Buddhist statuary. It has a fruit that is totally inedible. It's just there, something. This is the Borobudur. Borobudur was built in the 8th century. And it was kind of there and kind of got covered up and nobody knew where it was, particularly some people knew where it was, but they didn't pay much attention to it. And in about 1815, Sir Stanford Raffles got word of this and went out to find it and it had been pretty much covered by jungle. It's 403 by 430 feet and covers 26 or almost 27,000 square feet in area. Um, it's a, a Buddhist temple and you go there preferably early in the morning so that you don't die in the heat while you're wandering around it. It takes a good two hours to go through the whole thing. You can see it's massive, absolutely massive. The whole place is covered with sculptures on the side of the wall and there I think there are about 70 of these Buddha things, uh, statues on the top. And the, uh, some of these have been restored, some of them are beyond restoration, a lot of them are actually in very, very good shape for considering the age. And, um, just the, it's the whole life of the Buddha, you know, um, from beginning to end. And the plants and animals that are shown in these things have been done carefully enough so botanists in the past have gone there and identified the genus and the species of the plant based on the sculpture being shown. And here is Buddha talking and uh, there is some other, uh, it's, it's too complicated. <laughs> And that they're having a war, that's what they do in the Ramayana. And then here's the guards, but I got involved with a comic book. <laughs> and another tourist wandering around who's got a sarong wrapped around him, and these bell shaped things are actually got Buddha statues inside of them, although many, many are missing. Uh, and there's, you've got a terrific view from the top, and what you see in the far distance is Mount Merapi, so that the day it explodes, it's all going to go away, probably. That's the very pinnacle of the place. And there I am again, just to prove to the world. Big part? How old is the structure It's uh, built in the 8th century, probably about 8, 10, 8, but it took a long time to build it. And so it's, and so it's Nine, yeah, so uh, about 1,200 years. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's had a lot of work that's had to be done on it, and they had some areas that they were working on it uh, because of water. They had the whole thing has got internal water, um, not like pipes, not to get water in, but like gutters to make sure it gets out because it rains like mad at the right season of the year and have to try and drain it. There is another small Buddhist temple there. And it goes on. And these are very, very pretty. This is a very nice, very small temple, reclining Buddha. The other major thing here is this is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. As is Borobudur, it is a uh, Hindu temple. The Hindus came after the Buddhists. It's not terribly long after the Buddhists, but this one is also about AD 900 huge place, as you can see from the spoke down there, and you wonder how it stands up, how it stays standing, and especially with earthquakes and everything else. There is some of the areas of the temple had been severely damaged. Clearly, this statuary is related to India, and I don't know, Greg, if it reminds you of anything in Angkor, because it's approximately the same period. Huge place but hot, you know, I didn't hang on there too long. 
And then as you can see that a lot of buildings have fallen down and piece by piece. They're trying to put them back together. And just a pretty thought. Now we go on to what you have in Java. We had the ECOT from Bali, where you thought you were going to get the batik. You have the supplementary weave in Bali, where you thought you were going to get the batik. You get to Java, and what do you have? Batik. That's where they did all the batik. And some of it done very, very traditionally. They do it in many, many different places in Java. This is this artist studio called Ramachir Tassari. These people had a special exhibition in Portland last spring, and they had their stuff was uh, on an exhibition in the uh, Textile Museum in Washington, D.C. They have taken Batik and pushed it to new heights. They have, all of this is done on silk. They use commercial dyes. They use, don't use any organic dyes because they said that they couldn't use them because of the, they wouldn't be able to get the effects they want. Their stuff is not cheap, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> but it is stunning, and it has a tremendous symbolic load because it's the uh, mission of the uh, two people, one of whom is an American woman, she's married to an Indonesian man, to try and perpetuate uh, values of Indonesian culture through modern use of modern batik. This is the person they have in their staff, and she looks like she's a little plump, but I guess that you yeah, like that when you're seven months pregnant. And she's doing the traditional batiking, which is done with a little tool called a uh, tulis, and it's like a handle. It has a little cup on it with a little point, like a, it's like almost like a little funnel. And they come in various sizes, so that the process you sit there with this piece of cloth and you dunk this into a bucket of wax. You take it and wipe the tip off and then start drawing lines on the cloth. You either draw lines, you do dots, you do whatever it is that you got to do. So you do that entire thing and then when you get done with it, you turn it over and you do it again on the back side because you want to make sure that dye is not going to overrun anywhere. Uh, yeah. 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 It's actually in some ways easier to do it on the back side because you've already got you know like the shadow from the first side. This man is the individual artist that's affiliated with the studio. His name is Pacta Martono, and you can see he's totally involved with what he's doing. Absolutely, totally. And he's it's, it's got these tiny little things of putting all of these little dots on stuff uh, and being prior to the dying. And that's what he's done so far, prior to any dying. His um, work is always done with scenes from the mythology, from Ramayana Ramayana and stuff like that. And I've got two of them. Uh, they're over on the back wall as you can see later on and look at them, is that one of them is about, <laughs> these myths are really wonderful, one of them is about a woman that um, was a princess so, and that she was taken away and they had to try and rescue her and they had two guys that were going to rescue her and they got into fighting so that they're having a face off there and then they had to go to this lake and retrieve some magic potion from the lake and they finally did and then they brought that back to the palace along with the princess and that the reward they got for this is that they all turned into monkeys. <laughs> and I, I don't understand but that's okay. <laughs> This is another way of doing batik. It's called a chop, uh, spelled T-J-A-P in, in, in Bahasa, Indonesia. These are also a very interesting thing because the, when the Dutch came and they saw this batik and they said, hey, this is great stuff, but this is an awful lot of work. So back in Holland, they started carving wood things in order to stick in the wax and womp and stick in the wax and womp in order to develop a design. Then they ended up having these go back to Indonesia, and the Indonesians looked at them and said, well, it's a good idea, but wood is not going to work here because of this tropical environment. It'll just rot away in, you know, a day. 
So that they started making all of these out of metal, and all of these are, are hand-done metal work on a metal background. Some of them are just this is they were so elaborate that they, you know they could give you a headache to look at it. Uh, then next is you know just some of the dyeing on a very primitive and washing the cloth out, and more traffic because we're going to have to get out of town. <laughs> And, 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 you know, it's just amazing how they can get these kids on here and, you know, I, I, and still have population growth despite this. It's dangerous. You know? <laughs> and this one is very interesting because they got the traffic is all stopped over there and these young ladies are walking across the street as nonchalantly as you can imagine. And it's because right over here is a police station. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't pay any attention to that. <laughs> All of it, you can see, is that you're now in the world of Islam. All of these young ladies are going to school. They're coming back from school with all of their loads, their backpacks and full of books and stuff like that. All wearing hijab and all, you know, as far as I'm concerned, suffering in the heat. The boys are all in the front, you know, much more casual, but they're all in the back going along. These are young boys that are on their way to the mosque. It happened to be Friday, and so they're just having a good time, laughing at the foreigner. They're all dressed up. And they're go heading toward the village gate. The mosque is on the other side of that. And here's another place to do batik. Uh, a young a woman just doing the same thing with the little tool called the tulis. This was an interesting because it's almost like a sampler, and you could, you know, if you wish, take those and just cut them up, and you know, you got 12 souvenirs. And also, can be very, very complicated. But many of these started out as chops, and then were further elaborated with batik tools. More and more rice fields, they can get three crops a year there. I ended up back in Bali, uh, staying at this nice little hotel in a place where I said I was going to stay in this funky little hotel. I was on the second floor and looked down into the next door neighbor's house. The lots are about like we have here, some, well at least over on Idaho Street, they're 50 feet wide and 100 feet long. Uh, the front area is uh, devoted to the gods and every morning the lady of the house goes out and makes offerings. And the offerings are flowers and fruits and stuff like that. These offerings are everywhere. They're on the steps of stores, you know, sort of thing. They're on the ground and the trees. And, uh, you know, if you have a significant belief in these things, you really got to make sure that these guys are taken care of because it's clear when they got all these awards and stuff, they can get after you. So. <laughs> There she is, you know, is, is uh, giving the incense and also sprinkling water. You give, everybody gets bath. This is a really nice swimming pool, I'll tell you the truth. It's really very, very nice. This is a store called Threads of Life, which I mentioned at the beginning of this, that is located inside this, on the front street of uh, this little hotel thing. These are all examples of uh, organically dyed thread in the various colors you can get. They have a lot of material that comes from all over Indonesia because that's what their mission is, is to make sure that they uh, support all of the people that they have in their groups. They provide them a market and they also teach them marketing skills. Saw so that supplemental leak, uh, weave that is over there and the very first thing the supplemental left this is what you can do with supplemental left if you really work at it you know that sort of thing it would take a long time to do this but it's all supplemental hard to believe it's really gorgeous <laughs> it's a nice one i've got one sim similar to this over there these are from various areas of indonesia this is another supplemental weft. It's that uh, with these little flowers looking things, they're all been put in there separately as the weaving goes on. This is all of this stuff that's gone from now from the traditional to really the very artistic and also very uh, contemporary use of batik. Now this is the piece that's right over there. This is by a man named Lou Zeldis. He's a Westerner. 
and settled in Jakarta and started doing batiks, um, doing designs, and then he had staff that would actually do work and stuff like that. They're all very, very modern. And they're very striking. And one of them back there, as you see, as, as you'll see over there later on, is actually a layout of Borobudur. It's a, it's a, you know, an aerial view of what the whole thing is. Yeah. This is another store, and it has a bunch of batiks right here. Those folks are the first batiks that were made in Bali. <laughs> it's a new enterprise by a man named Chuck Akung, and he's developing a batik market and doing batik work there as a native occupation in, in Bali, where they had never had batiks before except for Western factory things. They had a lecture on all of these textiles. Here's another, these are batiks and ikats. Here's another chop. Can you imagine making that out of metal? Yeah, you know, it's just, you know, enough to drop you down. Uh, here's a young lady wearing a piece that I bought. <laughs> These are made into tubes, and that's, you can do a variety of things when you're wearing them. This is a really bright colored one. It comes from a totally different island. And this is the one that you have to have really deep pockets and go to the village where this is made. There are now only two areas of the world where this is done. We saw originally with the green and white one that I got in Bali, because that was a, a weft ecot so that the dyed threads were going back and forth. I got over to Guatabalapi in Flores. All the dyeing was done on the warp, warp threads. It's all the long threads that are dyed, and the weft threads were all one color. On this, the warp and the weft have been dyed in advance. So that's called the double e cut. And it, these, these are, you can see, I hope, some of the nuances of the design because you get white and white and then little rusty color and then a darker color in the middle and all of that was totally pre-planned and, and it's done only in one village. In Indonesia, it's done in, in the, which happens to be on the island of Bali. There is uh, another place that they do it in India. They used to do it in Japan, but they stopped doing it in Japan because there is just no, it's not economically viable anymore. It takes so long to do it that in Japan the cost of living is uh, sufficiently high so that, you, you know, I mean, you, how can you, you know, with a guy, if, if, if your standard salary is 50000 a year, and it takes a family over a year to make one piece of cloth, you haven't got much market. And so that, the, uh, that particular thing has died out in Japan. This is another nice piece probably from Sumba. This is just for the colors, they're really great. Also a plan that they do. And now it's finally gotten tired and going to go back home and found it interesting on the way out to the airport. We see animal health and welfare donate here. And it says at the top, hard to see it, it says good karma if you do that. <laughs> And then there is a Balinese safety belt. <laughs> and here's a little upscale kid with her little home hello kitty backpack. And just as you know it, that going to the airport, you're going to run across some unhappy thing. There's a broken road. And there they are fixing it. So I got alternate transportation. They put it on if I could take it. <laughs>
uh, which is something. much shorter time than I had thought that it would take. I mean, I just imagined sitting there for about a year doing it. And uh, he had, they had uh, when August and uh, Neil were here, you know, they had several pieces of his in, in their show in uh, the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland. And he's had, they're, they're having a one-man show of his things in uh, uh, Java. But, you know, as I was looking at the dancers, if you take a look at those in the back, you can see the posture of the arms and that tradition of the way they hold their arms out when they're moving around and being shown in batiks and in shadow puppets and in the actual dancing. It's just a tradition that's been there for hundreds of years to have them like that. So I have these things arranged sort of uh, in, in the way that I went there. The very first ones are from Bali. Now there was one there that's an indigo with white that I did, I got actually over the internet. Um, but it is a, um, well it was a batik dye I think she told me, is with all these little dots on it is that and the green and white one there and I pointed out continuously the black and white that uh, Bali um, has symbolic value for the Balinese because they say it's got black and it's got white but most of it is gray and that's white as far as they're concerned so that, that you find people wearing that particular black and white and gray plaid all the time and it, it's, it's more than just there. The next pieces are all from that village of Wachablapi. Um, except for, well of course I got that little Komodo dragon. I got another thing that I got in these little bitty ones that from uh, Java and these are done with chops. These are uh, little souvenir things, sort of, and done with chops and enhanced uh, somewhat with um, tulips, but mostly chop. I have, <laughs> it's just amazing, isn't it, how people can sit around and do all this stuff, and, and, you know, it's just, and over here, This is one of the, this was a very uh, difficult thing because there was one place that I wanted to go that it's got batik tulis that, yeah. The uh, one place that I wanted to go but unfortunately was unable to get there. Um, it's very well known for their batik tulis, that, and this is not, compared to this other place, this is a kindergarten design, but this is the only one that I ran across. This is the one of them that was done with that little tool that's like the little funnel, so that somebody sat there and, and drew and drew and stuff like that sort of thing, so as far as... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, then the other ones are from Lou's eldest, and that one of them, I've got two of them, you know, the ones with all the numbers, that, that's actually, that's pi, it's the, to 3,000 places or something like that. And I saw it one time at, at the Threads of Life shop, and I wanted to buy one, but she didn't have any more. She just had the, the, that whole, she had the fabric, but it had been made into a shirt. And I said, no, I want the whole thing. So I went around looking for it and finally found it at another place. But the place I got is actually, it's a knockoff. <laughs> yes. Tell me about the cats. The cats? The cats? Okay. <laughs> and I, I said when I first saw him, I don't know what kind of drugs this guy does. <laughs> But this I got on the internet, and it's, uh, I have over on the table, at the exit table, a list of, of resources and stuff, and this is from a company called Batik Tambal, and their headquarters in Virginia or something like that, but if you look at their website, they have lots of pieces by this, this guy who is just, you know, he's just, he's interesting. <laughs> yeah. 
and then there's another one here. His name is Mayar. And uh, then this one is done by another Bautista artist there. These are, I'm not sure what all of these, you know, a lot of these Bautistes like this are used by quilters who will use them in, as a centerpiece or a part of a quilt. They're also used in making jackets and, and dresses and stuff like that because having something like this on the back of a jacket is really stunning. Uh, I, I, I'm inclined to think that they're making a lot of them, you know, for the tourist trade because I didn't see any of these on Bali to speak of. But they had, and of course, nothing at all like these in Flores, but there's a big shopping street in uh, Jogjakarta, and that's where they had a lot of them, and you could find various qualities of them, good, bad, and indifferent sort of thing. But the ones that are Vantik Tambal, it's fun to look at their website. Carol? Yes. We have them at the gallery. Yes, you have, she's got some at the gallery, right at the Hauser Gallery. It has a selection of them. Uh, so you don't have to go to the web, you can just go to Seal Rock. <laughs> uh, this thing here, which I said in the very last last slide, is a really Bali Batik because it's by that new uh, studio. Guy's been in business maybe about seven or eight years. And they're all done, you know, like in downtown Ubud for practical purposes. But he's catering to the Japanese market. Yeah. You know, that's, there's no two ways about it. It's uh, practically all of his stuff. It's got a, a design that it's it's designed to appeal to the Japanese and been successful at it. It's cloth, the, the cloth he uses is rather coarse uh, compared to some other stuff. Now all of these things from, I said the Brahma to Sari, are silk. So this is... So it, it's a totally different feeling from from the other things, along with um, very very traditional. A lot of the, a lot of the designs are diagonals and zigzags and stuff like that. Very very traditional, and it's very rigid. You know, as you're doing, starting doing stuff geometric, it just comes out like geometrics. But Brahmacharya saris are not, you know, is that it's in this. And, and also this, uh, um, I don't know, scarf, I guess. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, more free-flowing sort of thing. This is also, whoop, by cheek. But it's more nearly a fabric of a uh, uh, machine batik sort of thing, not done necessarily done by hand, although some of it may have been enhanced by hand. But um, these are the way you see that this has a kind of a panel here. And so what they do. I need a skinnier body. <laughs> Get Nan here. And if you have this done, you have the panel. Whoops, I lost the panel. Did the wrong. Then you got the panel. And then so it's sort of like you've got two different patterns in your garment so that they, and you can do this like, you know, if you want it just, and it just depends on the woman how she's feeling that day, if she wants the front or the side or whatever, but, but that's the idea of it, is to have essentially some variation in what's going on. Very pretty color. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, Mostly it's dipped. Yeah, there are certain points so that you can do some touch-up in some of the ikat dyes where they will brush dye on, but it's, most of it is just dunked into it. 
and it's in the batiks, it's the resist, it's, it's all the wax will resist the dye. But the thing is, you've got to go through that waxing process multiple, multiple times in order to get things to come out. Um, but this one over here is, is just really amazing because if you look at the detail, it, it, you know, it is right out of your mind. But the guy had, he had to put wax on this diet boil it to get the wax out. Wax the stuff that he did not want to have the next color come into. Dye it. Boil it, get the wax out. And keep doing that until he figured he was done. Uh, and, and that's what the process is for all boutiques, but so that some of them are, you know, simpler than others. And when we come down to the ones that are done, you know, for commercially being sold in the United States. When they first started coming out with these, they were kind of expensive. They were about $6.50 a yard, whereas other cottons were selling for about $4 a yard. Now Batiks, Bali Batiks, uh, there are several manufacturers, but now they're selling for about $12.50 a yard. And these are, they are manufactured in Bali. They do have uh, factories there. Well, some of these are printed with chops, some of them are just printed printing things. This particular technique is called salt dyeing in that it's got dye spread onto it and then while it's wet you throw salt on it and the dye will just kind of run around and, <laughs> and it gets different uh, effects of, of going, you know, the things happening to it. You know, it's, it's almost like a tie-dye, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> so, this one is nifty because it's called flame or something like that. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is really an amazing thing. And, you know, it's supposed to be worn around. <laughs> Hot <rod>. Yeah. <laughs> this one is very interesting because it's kind of a double header. This is a very controversial design. There's a lady in um, Dallas, Rachel Greco, who runs a shop called Grandma's Attic. She's very uh, astute, and there's a lot of stuff with textiles, and she gives a lecture called The Forbidden Design, because we had a tradition in American quilting of the design of the swastika, and, uh, yeah. you know, she says all of this design, and used to never do it, and then she pulled this thing out, and here it is, is this swastika. And ever since Second World War, you know, is the swastika is almost never used in uh, any kind of modern quilting because of its affiliation with German Reich. However, there is a swastika design that's used in Asia to indicate a Buddhist temple. Mm -hmm. And it's shown on a map. If you see this symbol, like what I have in my little spot right here, by itself, on a map indicates that that site has, is a Buddhist temple. So that in places like Japan, you know, you might have dozens of them around. The problem with it is, is that if you turn this on the other side, it ends up being the kind of perversion that uh, Hitler brought about because the, the uh, lines are going in the different direction. And so, you know, it's one side, it's, it's considered, you know, I don't know whether I'm making any sense, is that the one, that, it's like a Z is the one that's for the Buddhist temple, but Hitler did it backwards and, and it looks more, you know, started out as an S. And uh, one of the things that Rachel pointed out in her lecture is that this design popped up at the same time all over the world. It was just not there and then all of a sudden it was found in India and in Hopi and, you know, everywhere around the world. And the uh, astronomer Carl Sagan thought it, that it was derived from a supernova that was visible and that, you know, everybody in the world saw a supernova and that they just co-opted the design into a, like a spiral galaxy. So there we have our more useless information. <laughs> and this is, you know, is, is a scarf done by the Brahma Tirtasari people is that uh, 
The colors are exquisite. Drape is beautiful. There we have it. So, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that one. I forgot about that. This is very special. Yeah, this is really interesting. I got this. Yeah, I used to live in New York City. And I went into this shop one day and, you know, sort of thing. And it was really, he had several of these. And I thought, oh, man, isn't that cute? You know, it's, it's that, uh, well, maybe then I have to get somebody to hold it up. <laughs> yeah, about, you know, hold them up. Uh, isn't that cute? You know, look at that. You got all this whole thing, and look at these trees, and it's like all these little monkeys and everything else. I bought it. And this is probably from Sumba. <laughs> Later on, I found out what's actually going on here. It's that this is a village. These are kind of fields. This is a wall around the village. These actually are monkeys. And these are trees, and what they would do is after they had wars is decapitate the losers and stick their skull on the trees. <laughs> Yeah, anything else?